Hi everybody, this is Anne Marie from Safe Havens Interfaith Partnership Against Domestic Violence and Elder Abuse. I want to welcome you all to our 2019 webinar series, Supporting Victims and Survivors of Faith. We're so happy you're here. I'm also very glad to have with me here today my colleague, Allison Morse Katzman, who is Safe Havens' Associate Director, and you'll be hearing more from Allison at the conclusion of today's webinar. So we wanted to begin by thanking the Office on Violence Against Women who has made this work possible for us. Um, we provide TA nationally, and um, this webinar series is part of that national technical assistance. We also do trainings and resources, so we hope we'll, you'll check out our, our um, website to see more about what we do. Today, I am absolutely delighted that we are having our present presentation come to us from Ujima, which is the National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black Community. Ujima's mission is to mobilize the community to respond to and end domestic, sexual, and community violence in the black community. It's an important mission, and I'm so glad um, that uh, we're hearing from them today. Um, presenting today is Whitney Par Parker, who is Ujima's program specialist. Whitney joined Ujima in 2017. She has a strong background in communications, planning, and development. And her goals are to grow and develop Ujima and strengthen its capacity to fulfill its mission. So um, we're hoping you go from strength to strength. Whitney, we're so, so glad you are here. And you can take it away. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, again, we are so excited and pleased to have this opportunity to share Ujima with um, our participants today. Um, I am going to go ahead and get started. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to um, ask them. I'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And um, I'll also provide my contact information. If there's anything that you think of even after the presentation that you want to ask, feel, please feel free to reach out to us. OK, so. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Ujima is the National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black Community. Um, Ujima is the third principle of Kwanzaa, which means collective work and responsibility. And um, as far as the black community, we understand that uh, the definition of the black community, we are not uh, monolithic people. So meaning that we're fluid, we seek to be fluid, inclusive, and embracing and understanding um, of this very special um, place that we're in. Um, the colors of Ujima are cocoa and sunrise, which uh, the cocoa represents um, our skin tone, and um, the sunrise represents the energy in which uh, the black community represents. Okay, and then um, our vision, of course, as you see here, is to create a world where black women and girls are valued, represented. Um, respected, I'm sorry, safe and free from violence. Our mission is to mobilize the community, respond to end violence, and serve as a resource to survivors of violence, advocate service providers, and the community. And the areas that Ujima focuses on, uh, domestic violence, sexual violence, community violence, and institutional and structural violence. So just to give you an overview of the, um, of the sections that we cover, domestic violence, the first three here, the physical, stalking, and strangulation, we know that uh, we identify these on a criminal and civil level, but we also know that there's emotional, economic, and economic spiritual, and technological abuse as well, um, which sometimes go, um, they go un, un uh, unrepresented in the criminal system. So when we speak of, say, technological abuse, we may talk about uh, stalking someone via text or stalking someone via social media. When we speak of spiritual, um, you know, where our religion comes into play, economic money, withholding someone's um, check from them or not giving them or only giving them an allowance, per se. Emotional abuse, how we um, uh, how we speak to people, how we may go about um, in our relationships and demeaning someone based on how they look or their appearance or whatever may have you. Um, and just some statistics here. So uh, something to keep in mind, 
that almost half of black women have experienced one or more of the following by their intimate partner, sexual violence, physical violence, and stalking. Uh, we also would like to point out that even though one in four U.S. women experience violence by her partner and two out of three children have been exposed to trauma and violence, these numbers are higher for women and children in the black community. And when we look at statistics, black women are three times more likely to be killed as a result of domestic violence than white women. And we also know that in almost all cases, black women who are killed by men in single victim or single offender cases knew their killer and over half of black victims who knew their offenders were involved romantically at some point uh, with their offender. Um, some factors associated with um, a man's risk for abusers, for abusing his partner, I'm sorry. Um, this chart is important because it gives us a breakdown of some of the factors that contribute to a man's abusive behavior towards his partner. And from this chart, the common denominator for the black community is the economic status. Historically, the black community has been deprived academically, socially, and economically. And for a black man, this makes it very difficult to contribute to society equally and therefore heightens the stress and violence in the home and towards his partner and children. All right, and then we have um, sexual violence, which is another piece that Ujima covered. So we look at um, sexual violence on campus and sexual violence uh, in the workplace, so sexual harassment. And then we also look at trafficking and uh, reproduction co co coercion, excuse me. Um, so looking at the black community, we are going to focus on HBCUs, which are historical, historically black colleges and universities. So um, for this webinar, we're focusing on historical black colleges, and since the focus is on black women, um, who are the dominant population at a HBCU, um, I can confidently say that a lot of the issues that uh, black women face on campus when it comes to talking about sexual violence, domestic violence, um, comes from the community. So in our community, it's very, uh, we don't really talk about the sexual violence that we face as black women. A lot of times, um, we do it to protect ourselves and to also protect um, the, the abuser as well. Um, so a lot of black women, as I mentioned, will have a hard time coming forward when they have been sexually violated because um, it's the norm for us not to talk about it or it's, or it's understood that no one will believe us if we do come forward. Um, and then by default, historically, black women feel like they have to, say, protect black men, say if a black man is her abuser. Um, we feel that um, it is our job to make sure that he is protected from society. Um, and then oftentimes, which means that we suffer in silence as well. So what we do know is that uh, typically victims are first or second year students. And um, um, oh, we got a question. So PWI, I'm sorry, stands for predominantly white institutions. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get my notes together, you guys. Okay, so um, as I mentioned earlier, most victims at an HBCU are typically um, first or second year students. 
and um, also the victim knows their attacker. And um, so, So, um, and then to speak about uh, some interesting stats about uh, black women. So, um, in Nebraska, 50% of people sold online for sex are black. And keeping in mind that only 5% of the, of the black, I'm sorry, black people make up 5% of the population in Nebraska. So, if you think about it, um, black women are not only um, the they're in demand for sex work. Um, and then another one in Louisiana, 49% of children of child sex trafficking victims are black girls. Meanwhile, black girls only make up 19% of Louisiana's youth population. Um, so another, um, another topic that we cover, community violence. So we look at this um, as war, riots, gang war, torture, poverty, and um, um, so all of these things uh, fall in line with um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, which um, includes multi-generational trauma and um, the absence of opportunity to heal or access to benefits available in, this, in our society. Okay, and then um, we look at structural and institutional violence, which includes racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, and transphobia. And then we also look at um, institutional, which is industrial prison complex, juvenile justice system, and school to uh, prison pipeline. Um, and then our policy work, uh, reauthorizing um, the Violence Against Women Act and the reauthorization of the Family Violence Prevention Service Act. And then our practice, trauma-informed, culturally specific services, which is what Ujima um, focuses on, restorative justice, uh, bystander intervention, and community education. And then for our faith-based communities, uh, Ujima is working to encourage, equip, and empower the faith-based community. And this is um, really why we would like to present this webinar today. Um, so we wanted to give you kind of like a background of what we do in hopes that it will give you a better understanding as to how we want to work closely with the um, faith-based communities to help empower them um, to reach out to and support their community as well. Um, so the chart that you're looking at right here um, is a breakdown of the African American community and um, how we are grouped in our uh, religious following. So um, the chart shows that close to 80 percent. Sorry, um, the chart shows that um, in the Black community, eight in ten uh, African Americans identify as Christian, and more specifically, Black Protestants. So it shows that the church plays a major role in the black community because at one point it provided everything we needed to survive. So the church is looked at as like this huge community center and it's where we go for all of our resources. And to understand why it's difficult for black women to report DV to their faith leader, um, you have to understand the dynamics of the black church. 
Um, and basically it's power and control. So the church also is where black men were able to regain power because in society, historically, that was taken away from them. So you have, you, when you look at the black church, majority of the congregation may be women, but everyone who is in a leadership role are majority men. Um, so when a woman comes forward about her abuser, she is typically talking to a man um, and uh, typically, she's typically talking to a man, number one, and then two, um, the church may look at it as trying to protect the family, but you're also looking at it as are they really protecting the man and not necessarily the woman or um, her children. Um, this slide here kind of gives you an idea um, of how pastors perceive domestic violence. So two in five evangelical pastors know a church member who has experienced DV in the past three years. We also know that 55% of evangelical pastors believe divorce may be the best response to DV, while only 4% do not. And one in two evangelical churches have a specific plan to help victims of DV. And, uh, this is a very good move. Um, it's a great move in the right direction for supporting domestic violence survivors. Okay. Um, Ujima is working to build relationships with our faith-based leaders to help clear the stigma around DV and the faith-based communities. Once we gain the trust of leaders, we can gain the trust um, of their of the members of the uh, of the church members and the community that they serve. It's important that we maintain a strong relationship with all faith leaders so that we are able to continue to educate their members about domestic violence and sexual violence within their communities. And we also want to make sure that churches who do have or who want to create a domestic violence or sexual assault program are equipped with the right information and the individuals who are advocating for the survivors are properly trained as well. And we also want to make sure uh, we are addressing the needs of each faith-based community. So prime example, um, just because we're black, it doesn't mean that um, every, every, just because we're black doesn't mean that the same um, service you're providing is going to work in the Muslim community as it will in the Baptist community. So we also have to look at how um, their faith drives um, the, the programming that we offer when it comes to DV and sexual assault. So what is the role of faith leaders in the faith community when domestic violence is disclosed or observed? So. Um, it is important that faith leaders provide support, guide, support and guidance to survivors. If the church does not have a program in-house, um, it is important that they keep a list of resources and relationships with local domestic violence and sexual assault organizations so that they can come in and assist um, with first steps. An even bigger role is seeing the survivors through the process with continuous support. And churches should also equip themselves with um, resources to distribute to their members who are interested in local assistance. Okay, and then um, how can community-based programs and faith leaders provide the best outcomes for survivors? So faith leaders who are interested in providing support should obtain training on how to become an advocate even though the church may not have an in-house program, at least someone on staff is able to support the survivor accordingly. Community-based programs should be equipped to handle faith-based communities accordingly based on the demographic and religion. Um, also, as mentioned before, uh, we may work in the Christian, what, what may work in the Christian community may not work in the Muslim community. And therefore, we need to educate ourselves on how to support um, each community accordingly. All right, and um, what does accountability look like for the perpetrator, and how does forgiveness work and concert or hinder accountability for the perpetrator? So um, when Ujima 
conducted, uh, it was back in November, I think it was, we conducted a faith-based uh, community roundtable, and a couple of the participants were from churches that are located here in the D.C. area, and they mentioned that um, they have support groups for men and women separately. So um, the women's ministry might host a separate um, meeting space for women who are victims of domestic violence, um, and then the men's ministry might offer the same thing for men as well. So offering a safe, a safe place, safe space and platform so that survivors can speak out and so also perpetrators can speak out as well. Um, we have found that uh, the perpetrator uh, may deal with some trauma themselves and then that needs to be worked through in order to understand where the violence comes from. Um, one of the faith-based leaders informed us that um, batterers will sit in support groups and the accountability begins with transparency. So sometimes a survivor is prone to forgiveness because her husband or batterer has, um, was abused as a child. Um, the church believes that it comes to, when it comes to addressing a man about DV, it is best done by another man. Uh, the men's ministry addresses domestic violence in more creative ways in order to avoid having the chilling effect um, on such an important conversation. So our suggestions for community-based programs, um, it's important to provide a space uh, for survivors to practice their faith, religion, or spirituality individually. Um, as a group, so providing um, a meeting space, um, allowing people to speak out, um, speak out on their issues. Also, um, important to facilitate access to uh, faith uh, services for those who are in need. Um, it is important that we partner with our faith-based communities, and as I mentioned earlier, understanding the community so that you are able to provide them with um, resources either uh, in-house or them coming to you for services. And then our faith-based institutions, um, as I mentioned before, it's important that they partner um, with local community uh, organizations as well so that we can get an understanding of, we both can get an understanding of how we can support each other. Um, also creating a um, space where uh, accepting, accepting um, other, other um, <laughs> um, so providing a space where, say, the LGBT community um, are welcome, providing a space where teens are welcome, um, where, um, And, and those who are not even in the faith-based community. So um, opening up your doors to, to all people who are interested in the health. All right, and um, again, as I mentioned, um, this is, uh, before we wrap up, this is the, uh, our information here. If you uh, would like to contact us, you can go to our website ujimacommunity.org. You can also find us on social media as well. Um, and if you have any questions, as I mentioned, um, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, are there any questions, anything that I know it uh, kind of went by fast, but are there any questions that I can answer that um, we may not have covered in the presentation? Uh, do any do any of our participants have any um, promising programs or practices? Sydney, while people, this is Allison um, from Safe Haven. While people are typing, I see some people are typing, 
while they're typing, could you talk a little bit more about the roundtable of faith leaders that you held across the country um, that you talked sure. about? A little more information about that? Yeah, so um, in November, we hosted a, a faith-based roundtable, which included a couple of uh, faith-based um, organizations from here in the D.C. area, and then we had some come from Chicago, and I believe there were some from uh, the mid uh, the West Coast there as well. So they came from different areas of the faith-based community. So we had Christian, we had the Muslim community, we had um, the, um, the Jewish community as well, and they all spoke about how they handled domestic violence in their community. And a lot of them mentioned that while they do have a program, they are overwhelmed um, with, the, with the response of people that come in to meet with them. And a lot of times they have to reach out to the, uh, the DV programming in the area, but um, they're in the process of building out their programming so that uh, they can address the need of their community. Because a lot of times um, you have programming that aren't culturally um, sensitive to the needs of the various religious communities. So um, like I mentioned earlier, just because uh, we deal with the black community, that doesn't mean that everyone is in the Protestant religion. You do have uh, black Muslims, you do have, um, you do have people in the black Jewish community. So we have to have an understanding of ways that we can assist them with their needs, but also be, um, also be, uh, helpful as far as um, their religious background. What about um, on moving forward, how are you going to take um, what you learned during that um, roundtable and, and what next steps are going to come out of that? So the, uh, the next step that, we're, that we are working on is, um, so we're working with our funder to develop a larger platform for this. So that was our first meeting. And so the second meeting is how are we going to tackle um, these issues. So I'm not able to um, provide a lot of detail around that because the next steps we're working towards, but um, it will be a training involved so that we can provide assistance. No. Um, Whitney, I don't know if you saw Courtney Fisher has a question um, about um, one thing that her agency can do, which is a, a Jewish agency but serves victims from all um, faith communities. What is one thing that her agency can do to be more culturally humble for African-American survivors who may be Jewish but also may be a different religion? Did you hear that question, Whitney? Yeah, I'm sorry, my mic was off. We're responding right now. <laughs> Oh, you can say it out loud, because I'd be interested in hearing, too, other than just reading. Well, um, Greta is doing my typing, and I'm doing the... Um... <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. This is Greta Gardner. I'm the Deputy Director for Ujima Incorporated. I've been sitting here with Whitney because I like to learn things, too, and we've been partners as we go forward. So we're in the initial stages of a lot of our programming. We're still in our infancy, and we're trying to stretch into our toddler years. So I was trying to help her um, coordinate with this webinar. So to answer Courtney's question, right, I mean, that's one of the big things about what do we do, particularly with communities that have multiple identities with regard to whether you're multiracial, biracial, whether you are of a different faith, and how when you come and you show up to your faith community, 
how can that faith community respond to your multiple identities? And so, Courtney, my best answer at this time would just be meeting people where they are. I mean, the fact you have an amazing program, the fact that you have you are already in so many communities as it is, and that you're partnering with those communities, letting that person that comes to you with their issues, whether they be at home, whether they be at work, wherever they're experiencing violence, and meeting with them where they are and letting them identify how they want to go forward and you providing as many resources as possible so that they can walk truly with integrity in their faith and yet be safe as well. So whether, you know, none of us are monolithic, whether they come to you and they're like, I'm really having a hard time with regard to this within my faith, but I also am having a hard time with regard to this in this other area of my life. If you feel you don't have the internal resources, then who are you partnering with? Who are your, who are your collaborators? so that when you're providing holistic services, you can really provide a warm handoff as opposed to uh, a flyer. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cheryl Spann. And I, too, am one of the most recent new hires uh, as of last year. And um, I am the program coordinator for um, an, a program called the Person Center Project, which is a project of UJIMA. And we work primarily, and also we're in partnership with the DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And so UJIMA and the Person Center were working um, to kind of address the question that you asked. You, you had raised around the diaspora. So we're working with, for example, the Ethiopian community, the Christian Orthodox um, Ethiopians, as well as uh, we haven't come across any Jewish Ethiopians at this point, but Muslims. Uh, we're also working with um, some West African countries, uh, Nigeria to be specific, and Ghana, um, where they're Catholics. Uh, so we're still, as Greta and Whitney mentioned, we're still in our infancy stage, especially the Person Center and Ujima, so we're still building capacity, we're still conducting outreach, and we also have um, many partners um, across the diaspora that we also um, solicit advice and resources when we're confronted with the same question. I think, you know, this is Greta, one of the things from the policy perspective that everyone should be aware of is that in a lot of the solicitations that are coming out from our federal funders, there are faith-based components now coming out. And so you will see a lot of the technical assistance providers doing a lot more faith-based interventions and prevention um, programs. And so I really do hope that they will involve local programming with regard to that. So if you see that trickling down through governor's uh, administration, through FIPSA administrators, et cetera, that you will be really, really intentional about involving yourselves in those programs. Um, we don't want these programs to be built in a vacuum, nor do we want them to be implemented in a vacuum. And we really will need all hands on deck to make sure that people are, um, you know, protected. One of the things that we do know is that faith can be a protective factor. It can also be a risk factor depending on who you're with, who your, who your community is, and, and really what their, um, their drive is with regard to handling people's faith responsibly. Did anyone have any other questions? Ema, did you want to add any last anything? No, I just want to um, thank everyone for participating. I know that we kind of <laughs> uh, breathe by pretty fast, but if there are any other questions, I'm more than happy to answer those um, offline and provide any additional um, information that may help us 
um, if there's anyone here that's interested in learning more about um, Ujima and what we do and kind of how we can get involved um, together, that'd be great. Well, this is Allison again. I just want to thank um, Ujima and Cheryl and Whitney and Greta for their participation in our webinar today from our Supporting Victims and Survivors of Faith series. Um, on the screen now, you will see that we've got several more upcoming webinars. Um, the next one is April 25th, um, and we've got, I think it's five more to go. So please feel free to spread the word. Um, and please note, this year we, on April 30th, we will have a um, webinar in Spanish. So please forward that to um, any uh, Spanish-speaking folks that might be interested. Um, and I just want to thank everyone again. Um, our contact information is right here. If you have questions about working with faith communities, um, Safe Havens has been doing that since 1991, working at this intersection of domestic violence and faith. Um, we have many re resources on our website about um, troubleshooting when, for outreach and ideas and, and information on different faiths. Um, please check out our website. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. That's what we, one of the things that we do is provide technical assistance to folks who are trying to do this work. Um, so if there are no more questions, uh, I just want to, I'm just looking right now. Um, thank you very much, Ujima and everyone, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you.